Hello, everybody, and welcome uh, to the podcast. Uh, today, I'm going to be going over UFC 261. I watched it, of course, yesterday, as the whole fucking world did. I don't know why I said that. And we have uh, three fights to get to that were championship fights and two other fights that ended in a very interesting stoppage. But nonetheless, they were part of the narrative uh, that took place. So first fight on the card was Jimmy Crute versus Anthony Smith. And in that fight, in the first round, Anthony Smith landed a leg kick that ended up hitting some type of... It looked like a nerve at first, but um, I'm guessing it's probably something a little bit more severe than that. Um, Anthony Smith ended up getting the win based off of uh, Dr. Stoppage to Jimmy Crute. He was walking on the leg all fucking funny. He looked like a clown on stilts because his ankle just kept giving out and giving out. But it didn't look like the problem was coming from the ankle. It looked like the problem was mainly coming from some other part of the leg. It looked like if you got a dead leg and then tried to run. And I was uh, saying as the fight was going on that I was very surprised his corner didn't stop it. The damage didn't look so severe as he was making his way uh, out to fight. But then as he was standing there, he would have these moments where he would roll over his ankle or where it looked like he was on the verge of slipping. And it would happen over and over again. And the whole time I was wondering why his corner would send him back out there, obviously with a compromised leg. Obviously, this guy has a lot of heart, and he wants to go and show that. And this is probably the biggest fight of Jimmy Cruz's career so far, I would say, being on such a big card uh, on the main card, pay-per-view. Still, though, I would... Caution against sending a fighter going at you know 25% of their full capacity, sending them out there against a killer like Anthony Smith. So that's just my opinion. And then in the the next fight, we had Chris Weidman versus... Uh, uh, fuck. I just forgot his name. Uh, he's like a Chris Rock. If Chris Rock got jacked, uh, Uriah Hall. <laughs> by the way that's not my joke that was uh my friend jason's joke as the fight was going on <laughs> he's making the comparisons between uriah hall and uh chris rock so there you go not out of my mouth uh but one of the worst stoppages you'll ever see doctor stoppage again uriah hall getting the win uh because his shins are so fucking strong and they broke chris weidman's calf uh, uh no sorry shin uh, chris weidman was throwing a calf kick he got shin on shin because uriah hall checked the kick and uh chris wide chris weidman had a very devastating break very reminiscent of the break that happened to Ant- uh anderson silva against chris weidman some years ago and uh anderson silva threw the same exact kick calf kick uh, uh, Chris Weidman checked the kick and from the shin on shin collision Anderson Silva's bone just completely broke it, like I said it was one of the most horrific injuries you can see based off the fact that it was live and you would never expect something like that especially in this game of modern MMA where the calf kick is so uh, relevant to a lot of fighters uh, game plans you would never expect to see something so drastic, uh, but it just reminds you the game you play in MMA where it's so dramatic, sometimes the physical consequences, and a lot of people don't recognize that. A lot of people, uh, sorry, a lot of people may sometimes forget how brutal of a game it actually is. And like Uriah Hall was saying, as he took the win like a champ, as he took the win like a man, he was saying that the real fight doesn't start when the cameras are rolling the real fight starts outside of the outside of the parameters of television you know once the fighters go to the back backstage whether they won or they lost they still have to treat injuries they still have to rehabilitate uh their minds and bodies to levels we 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 as fans could never understand you know when i saw that uh injury happen the first thing I thought of was, fuck, should I quit jujitsu <laughs> or any sort of uh, athletic pursuit I once have had uh, or I'm currently in? When something like that dramatic happens, 
you just think of, wow, it's a one in a million chance that we get injured doing, you know, normal everyday things. Granted, MMA is not an everyday thing, but it's something that has had thousands of fights uh, in between the time this has happened from Anderson Silva all the way to Chris Weidman. We've never seen this, at least in my opinion, at least in the UFC. We've never seen this. And so for all that time to pass, you would think that this problem is gone and out of the way. And then it takes a very horrific injury like that to happen where you realize that this could happen at any moment in time. Uh, Something interesting, uh, this is the fight afterwards. Uh, Something interesting that was said in the post-fight is Valentina Shevchenko, the champion, who we'll get into her fight in a moment. She said, "Who's a more, Valentina Shevchenko is a master of sport, I believe, in judo, boxing. She's uh, as high level as you can get in Muay Thai. She says she doesn't really favor that calf kick just because of the how dangerous it is, just because of the risk involved in it. So she doesn't really throw the calf kick or any kick that might land on the knee or be checked by the knee because she, she says... Um, the reward doesn't outweigh the risk. Sorry, I don't know if I fucking said that right. Did I sound like Scooby-Doo? The reward doesn't outweigh the risk. So she doesn't throw those kicks. But it's so interesting because you see that game being applied by a whole bunch of different fighters. Dustin Poirier just used it to success against Conor McGregor, a real success. I would say if Dustin Poirier didn't land those early calf kicks, that the fight would have turned out very different. I'm pretty confident in that. I would say anyone who watched the fight could be pretty confident in that. Not saying that Dustin wouldn't win, just saying that that played a pivotal role into his success, into his victory. Now, moving on from that, then we had uh, Valentina Shevchenko against... Jessica Andrade, and before this fight started, I didn't really take Andrade serious as like a as a challenger. I know she's very dangerous, but against stylistically Valentina's you know heavy Muay Thai output against Valentina's ability to trip and get inside and throw Andrade and just really give Andrade looks she's never quite seen before, even from Rose. I believed it was Valentina's fight to lose. And even as the fight was playing out, you saw a side of Valentina that you've never seen before. I mean, she just completely khabibed <laughs> Jessica Andrade, took her, ragdolled her, uh, moved position, you know, got to side control after all these trips. So she would trip Andrade and then move immediately to side control by doing this little like jump up by putting the shoulder pressure in and jumping up with her back legs to pass the guard, pass the legs. And then from there, from that position Andrade would sometimes turtle to lessen the damage or to maybe get back to her feet and Shevchenko would follow her and if she didn't do that Andrade then Shevchenko would just move to a crucifix type position and slowly but surely cook Andrade to the finish and that's eventually what happened look I'm just gonna say it straight up Shevchenko is my favorite fighter She's so disciplined. She shows up all the time, ready to fucking bang. She is the most, one of the most charismatic people in the UFC, but it's really different. I mean, you see charismatic people like uh, Conor McGregor. You see charismatic people like uh, Stylebender. You've even seen charis- charismatic people like a John Jones, and they're all different in their own right. But I think something's to be said for Valentina. She's so unique. I've never seen another fighter quite like her. Even Rose herself, who we'll get into next, is uh, unique in her own right, charismatic in her own right. Uh, Valentina is just, she reminds me of, she reminds everybody of an assassin. Like a, a, a complete gimmick of, not a gimmick, a complete uh, replica of like a Russian assassin woman that you would see in the movies. And could just kick your ass in two seconds and leave you on the floor bleeding. And maybe put a bullet in your fucking head afterwards. She's a savage, dude. No one is more game ready than Valentina in the UFC, man or woman. I don't think anyone's more game ready. You know, she knows three fucking languages. Okay, she knows uh, English, Spanish, and I believe Russian. I believe. I don't know. Uh... But like she's kind of hot in her own right. Very attractive woman. 
anyway, that's for a little, maybe a different podcast. I go into my love for Valentina Shevchenko. For right now, it's just her accolades as an athlete, as an athlete, excuse me, are kind of unparalleled. Except for Amanda Nunes, who she owes two losses in her career to, and Liz Carmouche. So Valentina's only lost three times, once to Liz Carmouche and twice to Amanda. And both Amanda uh, fights went to decision. First was a split decision, and the second was a unanimous decision that Amanda won. <coughs> I don't know if I'd love to see that fight again. I think Amanda's just way too big. But skill for skill, I think Valentina beats her 100%. 100%. I think Valentina beats any woman on the planet. Maybe um, Rose Nama Yunus would give her some problems, but they'll never fight because they're apparently good friends. So with that out of the way, let's move to Rose Nama Yunus versus Wei Li Zhang. Now, of course, one of the big storylines in here was uh, Rose kind of deviating from her holier-than-thou kind of... Uh, not holier-than-thou, but Rose kind of deviating from her saintly outward appearance into more of a combative role like saying better dead than red and having all these anti-communist remarks and even though she said they weren't really directed at Wei Li you kind of got the feeling that she was using that as fuel um you know coming from a Lithuanian heritage uh, a territory once occupied by the Soviet Union she was using that as motivation and fuel to get ready for the fight to fight for something more than herself. And a lot of people read into it. You know, when the first article came out that I read earlier this week or maybe last week, when the first article, I think it was last week, yeah, when the first article came out, um, you know, talking about Rose, Rose's remarks, I didn't look too much into it. I was like, okay, that's a little off kilter from the usual Rose we see. Nonetheless, though, it's just a way to get her ready for the fight. Like, who gives a fuck? You know how many crazy things fighters have said to get ready for fights or. Uh, to motivate them in the lead up. I mean, you had Mike Tyson basically yelling at a reporter that he'd rape him. You had Mike Tyson <laughs> telling a reporter that he'd be his bitch. You had Conor McGregor ripping a whole fucking nation in Brazil saying that he'd ride in on horseback and take off Jose Aldo's head. And, you know, not that these weren't big kind of scandals in their moment in time, but there's just a lot of things. When you go into the mentality of a championship fighter, you're not going to see the most politically correct sentiments in their head, okay? They're going to fucking go to deep and dark places to win, and that's what I like to see, and that's what happened. Rose Namajunas, head kick first round, knocked Wei Li into the other side of the fucking realm, into the other side of the fucking octagon, and the crowd in Florida went fucking berserk. And they deserve to because Rose is, like, once again, one of those charismatic people who isn't traditionally charismatic like a Jorge Masvidal or like a Conor McGregor, uh, still in her own right, is just a very special person, very cute person. And you can tell she has doubts. And you can tell just from her, you know, body language and her, her the way she speaks about uh, her process, she is a true martial artist, but a true martial artist has doubts. A true martial artist has these type of insecurities about their skill set. They don't let that interfere with their preparation. They don't let that interfere with their uh, with their actual performance. And that's the sign of a consummate professional. And that's what Rose is. Something deep down her. Something deep down inside of her is impenetrable and you can see that you know on the sort of the sort of the surface level she seems kind of insecure and unsure of herself but yet still grounded but then when she gets in the octagon she knows what the fuck she's doing all and you see these opponents kind of falling for that timid act and feeling like they can be the bullies and maybe they're going to have their way with Rose and completely demolish her like, both on the ground and on the feet. And then when they get to actually fight her and when they're in the octagon with her, it's like there's a switch that goes on both in Rose's mind and the opponent's mind because they realize this girl was kind of playing a game with them and this girl is much, much stronger, more skillful than they could have ever anticipated. Just overall, that was one of the most magical scenes I've ever seen in MMA history. My, you know, couple of years watching the sport and getting balls deep in it. That was one of the most intense. Uh, sorry, let me turn this shit on. That was one of the most intense 
uh, post-fight interviews while in the octagon that Joe Rogan has given in, to another fighter is just so heavy. And you could almost see like fireworks going off both in the crowd and, you know, in the whole MMA world that Rose had won. Not that it would have been different if Wei Lee won, you know, whether whether she's <laughs> from a communist country or not doesn't matter. Uh, MMA fans, if you're a true MMA fan, just like seeing the ultimate pinnacle of the sport being rewarded. Uh, so when you saw that with Rose, you just saw like, damn, this girl lost her belt in a kind of dramatic fashion by being slammed on her head, but she never let that get the best of her. Came back, uh, went the hard way by facing Jessica Andrade again, went the hard way by facing a ferocious up-and-coming challenger in Wei Lee. She's a champion again. I don't know who would deserve it more. Um, and then we're going to move to the main event with Kamaru Usman and Jorge Masvidal. And I'm going to fucking say this. Okay. I've said this yesterday to my friends as we were watching the fight. I was like, if there was one person I could have all of their skill sets and this is what I said in 2021, 2020, 2021, if there was one fighter where I could have their complete skill set. It's going to be Kamaru Usman. You know, back in 2016, maybe, I would have said, if there was one fighter I could be, it would be that either Habib Nurmagomedov or Conor McGregor. But now in this day and age, with this, you know, new meta of MMA coming in, I would be Kamaru Usman. And you would be like, whoa, why wouldn't you be Francis? Whoa, why wouldn't you be Izzy? It's like, being a master striker is a huge advantage. But the skill set Kamaru Usman has is just incredible. Again, he's like a GSP in the sense that he's not amazing at one thing. He's really good at wrestling and, you know, breaking you down from the tripod position and cage and uh, cage wrestling, fence wrestling. Uh, but he's never, like, blow you out of the water in one way or the other, in my opinion. He's just well-rounded at everything now. At the beginning of his career, maybe it was the wrestling. Okay, he's just... Excellent, 8 out of 10 in the wrestling department. But now, it's like 8 out of 10 in the wrestling department. And the striking, it's a 7 to 7.5 out of 10. But it's fucking good. In the sense that it's fundamental shit, but he is so strong. And his mental game is so, like, at another fucking level that not many people can hang with him. Right now, Usman's the greatest pound-for-pound fighter in the world. And if not him, then John Jones. No one's no one's as dominant as a, of a champion as he is. See, you have Izzy, and Izzy's been quite a dominant champion, at least in uh, middleweight division for the moment. Of course, he went up and fought Jan to get that double champ status, but that was at uh, 205, so it was a light heavyweight, and he got kind of uh, bullied there towards the end of it. Um... But he doesn't have as many title defenses as Kamaru. And I think Kamaru, I knew coming into this fight, I hoped, you know, Jorge would have found a way to win. I just had a big feeling he wasn't going to. Jorge's a really good striker. Really good wrestling, but it's not offensive wrestling. That's a, that's a main difference. You could have defensive wrestling, but even though you're defensive wrestling, say Kamaru tried to go that route and grind out another five-round uh, decision victory based off his wrestling. See, Jorge is just going to defend the whole time anyway. So he's probably going to be down on the scorecards anyway. And when you're defending, you're using so much energy and you're never going on the offense. So unless Jorge had a, a game plan to go on the offense with his wrestling, I don't think that would have gone his way either. This was Jorge's fight to win. I just think there is a something to be said for his overconfidence, letting his hands down to defend the takedown or watch out for the level change. And he got caught. That's just what fucking happens. And he got caught by someone. And you could see the difference in Kamaru striking when Jorge's fucking spit and sweat is flying, you know, three feet away from his face. I bet someone on that first fucking row beside cage side caught some of his sweat or spit. That was a fucking nasty strike. Okay. And uh, I think Kamaru beats Colby too. 
Now, I, again, I would want Colby to win based off whoever you think about him as a person. I think Colby Covington is an outstanding fighter, and I think he's... Uh, <sighs> I think, honestly, he's one of the most <laughs> underrated fighters in that division. Obviously, he's going to get another title shot. But I don't think he beats Kamaru, to be honest. I mean, Colby's more of a volume striker. So is Kamaru, in a way. But now you're seeing Kamaru kind of transition. And does, instead of being a volume striker, he's a very precise, very uh, doesn't-make-a-lot-of-mistakes type of striker. And he has power fucking dynamite in his hands at least in his right hand something that colby does not possess and again maybe colby has a different game plan going into the next fight maybe he tries to go on the offense and actually wrestle kamaru get him up against the fence and maybe take him down but i think that's a very tall order unless we're seeing unless we haven't seen the best of the best colby covington um which in a way i feel like we have seen the best of the best colby covington and we saw that Colby Covington fight Kamaru the first time. And he lost pretty handedly. No matter what Colby has to say, in that fifth round, when it all counted, and when it was pretty much 2-2 on the judges' scorecards, with the fifth round open for anyone to take it, Kamaru took it. Kamaru beat him. And I think that's going to happen again. Uh, both had a full camp. No excuses. You know, they say, uh, some people say, Colby had his jaw broken. Colby, of course, refutes that claim. It was clear that Colby was injured in some form or another. He just has balls of fucking steel. He just has a dragon's soul, or what is it called? Dragon's blood, tiger's blood. And he came back to fight no matter all those injuries. Uh, but I think Kamara's going to be your champ for a while. If he beats Colby, it's like, dude, he might as well retire on top because there's nothing else left to fight for, in my opinion. And if MMA, this is how I view MMA, get your wins, create the legacy you want, make your money, and then get the fuck out of there as fast as possible. Now, obviously, I'm not a fighter, and I look at it from a different, more realistic kind of practical point of view, uh, but that's that's what I would do. So overall, this card was fucking bananas, and it just renewed my love for MMA and my love for combat sports in general, but specifically for MMA and the beautiful time we live in. This is the, this is obviously with MMA being such a new sport. This is like the golden years of MMA, and I cannot even wait to see how all these sort of scenarios play out in the future. But for this week, this was an amazing event, and I think I'll be cherishing it and thinking about it for time to come. So, thank you for watching. If you like, subscribe. Thank you. Bye.